Yeah, so um, in broad terms, uh, my research focuses on understanding um, the community of microorganisms that inhabit our intestines or our guts, um, also known as um, the gut microbiome. Uh, so we have recently begun to uncover the potential of these microbes to shape human health and physiology. Um, however, before we, we can use these microbial communities, these gut microbes in our favor, for instance, to improve human health, there's still many details that, that need to be uncovered and we need to expand uh, our knowledge about how this community of microbes is established, um, is modulated and, and how it communicates um, with the host and how it actually shapes host physiology. So this is what my research um, currently focuses on. Um, in particular, we are interested in understanding the role of small RNA molecules like microRNAs in host microbe communication in the gut, um, and also on getting a deeper understanding of how gut microbes interact with common medications, with pharmaceutical drugs that um, we frequently take, um, and whether we can manipulate the gut microbiome perhaps in the future to increase the efficacy of, of common medications or, or um, drugs that, that we take. Um, so to the second part of the question, I, I became fascinated by the human gut microbiome during my PhD. Um, my PhD project was focused on a single bacterium, a pathogenic one, that causes inst intestinal infections or gut infections um, named Clostridioides difficile or Clostridium difficile. And at the time, my PhD project had nothing to do with the gut microbiome. I was simply focused on investigating, on studying this pathogen, its physiology, and on also on developing improved tools to genetically manipulate this pathogen. Um, and it was quite an important bacterium to study at the time because new hypervirulent strains of C. difficile emerged around the world, causing many outbreaks in hospital settings. Um, and so uh, while I was studying it, uh, I mean, I realized that, and, and this was common knowledge, that the reason why C. diff is typically associated with, with hospital outbreaks was because it can only cause infect and or colonize infect and cause disease in individuals that are somehow um, debilitated, um, and in particular in individuals whose gut microbiome had been disturbed or, or disrupted, uh, for instance, after taking antibiotics. And so as time passed, I, I became fascinated by this. Why is it that the commensal gut microbes, um, the beneficial microbes that live in our guts, how, how do they provide this resistance to pathogen infection? Um, and by the end of my PhD, I was sure that this is what I wanted to investigate next. Um, and this led me to write uh, a Marie Curie uh, European project on the topic, um, which was funded. So after my PhD, I joined the team of, of Professor David Berry uh, at the University of Vienna in Austria. Um, and that was where I, I started to apply single cell approaches complemented with omics and many other microbial uh, ecology methods to investigate the, the gut microbiome and the mechanisms by which it can uh, prevent um, colonization by, by the pathogen, um, in particular, the pathogen Clostridioides difficile. So by the end of the project, we did find a, a consortium of, of commensal microbes, five gut commensal microbes that uh, by depleting sugars um, that the pathogen uses as a carbon source um, were indeed able to reduce, partially reduce the number of pathogenic cells in the gut. Um, of mice, which we used as a model. Um, and so basically, this is how I started uh, in the field of gut microbiome research, by, by looking into colonization uh, resistance. And I transitioned more recently to investigate a lot of different um, aspects of, of, of it. So um, next generation sequencing approaches, such as metagenomics, um, dramatically expanded our understanding of microbiomes, not only of the gut microbiome, but of microbes all over the planet. Um, 
um, every microbial ecologist, I think, would agree with me. So metagenomic sequencing in particular provides a great overview of which microbes are present in a certain environment and what is their genetic potential, their genomic potential. However, linking that information to actual microbial functions, to the phenotype of cells um, in, in situ, in the environment, can be um, challenging. And one of the main reasons is because many genes in these microbial genomes that we unveil with metagenomics, many of these genes lack a proper functional annotation. So it's hard to really predict their functions in situ. Um, but we can couple metagenomics with single cell approaches, um, which uh, I have been, been doing um, in, in the past years. Um, and in this way, we can overcome this limitation. And this is because there are a lot of single cell approaches that can be applied in, in microbiology and in microbiome research that enable us to study, to directly probe for microbial activity and for microbial response or transformation of particular compounds. Um, for instance, if we couple single cell techniques with stable isotope probing, so in stable isotope probing, we use isotopically labeled atoms in molecules. These are commercially available. There are a, a lot, a large variety of, of molecules, metabolites, drugs, nutrients, whatever that are isotopically labeled. Um, and we can use them to um, um, look or can amend them to microbial communities um, in, in, a, in a setting that is close to their natural environment or even in their natural environment. And we can leverage them to detect which microbial cells respond or incorporate that particular nutrient by tracing these stable isotopically labeled um, atoms. Um, so if we are able to couple these single cell techniques and this stable isotope probing, for instance, with the identification by sequencing or other techniques of the cells in which we detected the incorporation of these isotopically labeled atoms. So if we couple these two things, detection of the atom and the identity the, to reveal the identity of that microbe, then we can really link a particular microbial function, which is a response to a compound, to the microbe. Uh, even if the genes behind that function are still lacking a, a proper functional um, annotation. Another major advantage of single cell techniques is that they can reveal the variability between individual cells of the same species. So microbial populations, even on this, of the same species, we do know that they are not uniform. Individual cells can have different physiological states or metabolic capacities. And this information is lost um, when we do just metagenomics on, on or analyze the mixed sample and don't look at, at the single cell level. So in my opinion, single cell techniques um, are, are really powerful. Maybe they are not so widely applied yet because they ha typically have low throughputs. Uh, but in recent collaborator collaborations with chemists and, and engineers and experts in optics, our team has been able to increase the throughput of some of these single cell techniques. And so I'm optimistic that, um, that first, that this will still be further improved. And second, that by increasing these throughputs, um, these techniques will, will become more and more attractive and applied by a, a large number of, of microbial ecologists um, in the coming years. At least I do hope so because I, I, in my opinion, they are really uh, powerful approaches. So a large fraction of common human medications or pharmaceutical drugs that we take um, are actually taken orally. And thus they pass uh, to the gastrointestinal tract. So they, they go to our guts and in the gut they become in contact with microbes. Uh, in most cases, this occurs in the upper parts of the intestinal tract before the drug is absorbed. But in many cases, also these drugs make their way into the colon where the density of microbes is even higher. And so they potentially encounter and they encounter and potentially interact with, with a lot of these microbes in um, our intestines. And there have been numerous recent studies, including from our team, showing that microbes in our guts um, really um, have the potential to interact with pharmaceutical drugs or do interact with pharmaceutical drugs. And uh, an interesting um, 
point to, um, or to make is that these interactions are bidirectional, meaning drugs impact microbes and their growth and activity, um, but drugs also impact, um, 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 sorry, but microbes also in, impact drugs. They can also modulate drugs and potentially affect their efficacy. Uh, in either case, this can have a tremendous impact on human health. So we really need to put more effort into understanding these interactions with some detail. Um, so just to, to uh, briefly explain how gut microbes in, impact drugs, microbes have enzymes, have evolved or acquired enzymes to metabolize almost any compound that reaches our guts. Um, and it's not surprising that they actually are able to transform or metabolize or metabolize or alter the structure of orally taken drugs. And this can result in drugs becoming more toxic, uh, more or less active, um, or having even entirely new effects. Um, for instance, um, microbes in the small intestine can convert uh, the Parkinson's disease drug levodopa, which is the, the most widely used drug to treat Parkinson's disease. Uh, and this, it, this occurs before the drug gets absorbed into the bloodstream and it limits its availability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So it has a real impact on the efficacy of, of the drug. Um, on the other hand, we also know that drugs can affect microbes. Um, for instance, we have recently discovered that the different Parkinson's disease drug termed entacapone complexes or sequesters iron, and iron is a crucial cofactor for gut microbial enzymes. So microbes exposed to this drug starve because iron is no longer uh, available for them. Um, and this leads to major metabolic changes in the gut microbiota. Um, and we do know that the gut microbiome does regulate and affect a lot of aspects of host physiology. And so this can potentially contribute to um, um, modulating or altering human physiology or even to the side effects of the drugs, because if we are altering, if the drug is uh, dramatically altering all the activity of these microbes, maybe that's what's behind the diarrhea or constipation or other side effects that are commonly seen in patients that take um, this particular uh, medication. So in my view, this is a, a fascinating and important area of research because if we gain a better understanding of these bidirectional drug microbiome interactions, we may be able to, in the future to develop novel microbiome-centered therapeutic strategies to, to improve drug efficacy and, and to minimize adverse uh, drug effects, um, which, which would be um, really a, a major achievement, I think, uh, for us to basically give a new life to existing pharmaceutical drugs, right? So overall, I enjoy working in multidisciplinary teams and I have been fortunate to have had excellent experiences with all teams I worked with so far. Um, but with this being said, of course, there are always little difficulties. Um, an obvious one arises uh, from the fact that we microbiologists use terminology and concepts that are perhaps not so common or trivial for chemists or engineers or experts in optics with, with whom I collaborated with, um, and what, the other way around and vice versa. They also use some terms that are not so familiar um, to me or so easy to, to sort of understand um, uh, to us. Uh, but sooner or later, um, I think if this created some misunderstandings, sooner or later, we always ended up uh, clarifying any of these little misunderstandings. Um, other times, we also ended up um, in long discussions um, because one of the parts did not fully capture the limitations of the instruments or the approaches that the other was, was developing. Um, but I think at the end, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, sooner or later, we always, by, by openly discussing these, these issues, we, we always uh, manage to, to drive the projects uh, and, and to get a good output out, out of the projects we develop together. And I think the key is really just to embrace that there will be some challenges and just openly talk about it. Um, and I, I think 
Um, that's a secret in any case for any collaboration, I guess. So um, I guess in the field of the human gut microbiome, um, a new emerging trend that holds great potential um, is, I would have to say, is, I, I think it's the development of, of personalized microbiome-based therapies tailored for each individual, because each person has a unique microbiome, a different microbiome. Um, and so these um, uh, personalized microbiome-based therapies will include, um, or I mean, even before we reach the part of the therapy, these microbiome, personalized microbiome interventions would include microbiome profiling to predict disease risk, um, to predict response to a particular diet or dietary compound um, or the response to drugs or, or treatment efficacy. And in the future, uh, the personalized microbiome interventions uh, such as tailored probiotics, prebiotics, or um, microbiome transplants um, could help treat or prevent diseases more effectively by simply restoring or modulating the gut microbiome to optimal conditions. At least I like to think that that will be the future and that our research um, will, will lead to, to, to these advancements sooner or later. Um, to take just one example of something that is already happening, not by my team, by, by others, but in cancer therapy, the success of immunotherapy is linked to, to or has been linked to specific microbiome profiles and this has led to efforts by, by um, other teams to modify the microbiome to improve treatment outcomes for um, individual uh, patients. <laughs>